Good afternoon, everybody. Mr. Hop here, and we're going to go ahead and get this lesson started on the legislative branch. Our legislature is discussed in Article I of the U.S. Constitution. We talked about this in the last unit, and we're going to keep talking about at least the next three articles, the, the Article I, R2, Article III, in the U.S. Constitution on our three branches of government. Now, we know that the legislature, they make the laws for us, and our, our, our legislature in the United States is going to be bicameral. Over here on this side, I have keywords that you need to know. If you don't get them all up here, they're going to be in class also. These, these words will probably be on the test, so very important to know these words here. So we're bicameral, meaning two houses. We, we know that already because we talked about that a whole lot in the last unit. And they're going to meet at the U.S. Capitol building. That's the, it looks something like that uh, in Washington, D.C. I'll show you guys some pictures of it probably on Monday. Now, our Congress is going to consist of two houses, bicameral, the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Whenever they meet each year, whenever they meet, we're going to call those congressional terms. The term is going to start on January 3rd of odd number years. And it's typically going to end on July 31st. In some cases, it can end a little bit longer than that. But generally, July, January 3rd to July 31st. Now, there's going to be special cases where it lasts longer, but don't worry about it. Uh, sometimes we're going to have meetings, and we're going to call these special sessions. Uh, these are usually in times of crisis, such as uh, September 11th, when the terrorists attacked the World Trade Center, the White House, or, or the, the, the Pentagon, and December 7th, 1941. Well, it, they didn't meet on December 7th, but they met December 8th, the day after, uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941. Now, whenever both houses meet together at the same time, we're going to call that a joint session. So, for instance, the State of Union Address. Whenever the President gives the State of the Union, both houses of Congress meet together, and we're going to call that a joint session. Now, we know that our, our legislature is bicameral, two houses, so we're, we're going to talk about both houses. First, let's talk about the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives consists of 435 voting members. Five non-voting members also can include in this. They're from Puerto Rico, Guam, America, Samoa, the Virgin Islands, and the District of Columbia. They don't vote. They can participate in debates and everything, but they're not going to get to vote. They're, they're, they're just going to represent their constituencies in the House of Representatives. Now, over here on this side, I have keywords. Um, make sure you know these words. I didn't, well, constituents, constituencies, same thing. These are people who are represented. These are people who fall within congressional districts. We're going to get to that. Now, members of the House of Representatives, they're going to serve two-year terms, and you must be at least 25 years old. So if I wanted to, hey, I can run to be a House, or a house member. I, I can run to be a U.S. representative. You must be a citizen for at least seven years, a, citizens of, a citizen of the United States for at least seven years, and you have to be a resident of the state in which you are trying to represent. Now, each member is going to represent, or is going to represent an area called a congress, congressional district. If you didn't know, Kerry, Kerry's in the fourth congressional district. Now, the number of representatives each state is going to have is going to be based on population. And what do we call that? Proportional representation. Now, each state can be guaranteed at least one seat. So, whenever you think about states uh, such as California, Florida, North Carolina, New York, there's there's a lot of a lot of representatives from those states. Um, now, what about the smaller states with people such as South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, South Dakota, North Dakota? They don't have a lot of people, but they do have at least one representative. Uh, whenever whenever uh, Congress is going to meet. Now, the House is going to be apportioned, another key word here, apportioned, or divided up based on population. You can consider the House of Representatives also the people's house, because the House of Representatives, they're going to represent the people. Now, every 10 years, the Census Bureau is going to count the population in the states to determine the number of districts in each state. We call this reapportionment. 
Congressional districts include roughly the same number of constituents. Now, there's going to be a Supreme Court case, which we're going to get into later, but this case, if, if, if you want to look into it now, it's going to be Baker versus Carr from 1962. Now, each legislature is responsible for drawing con congressional districts. The governor, our executive branch, our, our executive branch in the state, is not involved in this process whatsoever. Our state legislature is going to be called the General Assembly. I did an internship there my senior year of college. Had an absolute blast. Got to meet many constituents, people from within that district, and I, I was really part of the legislative process. It was a, it was a great learning experience. Now, each congressional district must be contiguous. Now, what is contiguous? If you want to look it up, I'll tell you. It means touching. It has to be, it has to be touching. Each congressional district must be must have roughly the same number of constituents. Sometimes district lines, district lines will be drawn in a certain way. Like, for instance, if we have North Carolina, we're gonna say that's North Carolina. I'm no artist, but we're gonna call those districts. You really can't see that. I'll probably just draw you a better one whenever we get to class on Monday. But drawing lines a certain way or redrawing lines a certain way that's going to benefit uh, one particular party or candidate, we're going to call that gerrymandering. Now, congressional districts are routinely gerrymandered by state legislatures. For what reason? So that they can be benefited in some way or another. Now, state legislatures try to create districts that are going to benefit their parties. That way, whenever they go up for re-election or something like that. They can secure seats. They can, they can lock into positions in the, in the House of Representatives because they're going to have key people in that district, key people within that uh, congressional district line that's going to benefit their party or benefit them to become uh, House members. Now, parties are going to try to stack districts with as many party members as possible. This creates those safe seats that I was just talking about. Now, if, if you think about it, if you do that, it really takes away competition. Uh, generally, House of Representative seats, they're not very competitive. Uh, if you win your party's primary and a safe seat, you're pretty much guaranteed to win in the general election. So, just some, I guess that would be a little mischievous. Now, the House of Representatives, they're going to have certain jobs that only they can do. The House of Representatives, they can start laws to make people pay taxes. They can decide if a government official should be put on trial before Senate. If he or she commits a crime against the country, we're going to call that impeachment. Formally accusing a public official. That's impeachment. Next, we're going to talk about the Senate. The Senate consists of 100 members. We have 50 states, and each state is going to have two senators. They're going to serve six-year terms. To be a U.S. senator, you have to be at least 30 years old, be a U.S. citizen for at least nine years, and you must be a resident of the state in which, with, in which you are running. Now, the Constitution states that the vice president has formal control of the Senate and is known as the president of the Senate. But actually, the vice president is only present for important ceremonies and to cast a vote uh, in a tiebreaker. The president pro tempore is actually the one who's going to do most of the day-to-day -day functions within the Senate. This is going to be your Senate member who has tenure, the one who's been there the longest. Now, senators are going to represent the entire state compared to the House of Representatives. Representatives in the House, they're going to represent their districts, but senators, they're going to represent the whole, the, you know, the, the state as a whole. Okay, finally, we're going to wrap up here with these last two terms, the majority party and the minority party. It, it's really self-explanatory, guys. Uh, the majority party is going to be the political party that has control of more than 50% uh, of seats in the House or the Senate and the minority party. It's going to be that other party, the, the party that has less than 50% of the whole entire party. Now, in the House of Representatives, 
you're going to have the Speaker of the House. The Speaker of the House is the most powerful leader in the House of Representatives. Is always going to be a member of the majority party, and he or she is in charge of floor debates and influences most House business. And in terms of succession, so we have the President, Vice President, the next person is going to be the Speaker of the House. Now the first, well, just recently, the uh, past Speaker of the House was Nancy Pelosi, and she was actually the first female Speaker of the House. Now, the vice president is technically, technically the leader of the Senate, but rarely attends and only casts votes to break a tie. The president, pro tempore, like I said already, actually presides over the Senate. Member of the majority party with the longest tenure in the Senate. Now, party leaders are going to make sure that laws are in the best interest of their party and try to sway votes a certain way. The more likely it's going to benefit them, or, or, or if they don't want to vote past, then they'll try to sway it against it. Finally, party whips. These are going to be assistant leaders. These are leaders within the party, so they're not actually the leader, but they're assistants, so we're going to call them party whips. They keep track of where party members stand on issues and round them up for key votes. And guys, that's going to, that's going to do it for now. Uh, on Monday, we're going to get some things done.